Hey guys, this is Miss Ginter. Um, I'm here again today back with another lecture video. So I know sometimes you guys don't love when I do lecture videos, but I felt like this would be a good one to have on hand. Um, you know, I'm stuck at parent-teacher conferences right now with no conferences, <laughs> um, but that's okay. So I'm going to use this time to record this lecture video for you before we get too much into the video. Um, please make sure you have notebook paper and a pencil to be able to take notes. As always, I will also post the Google Slides or the PowerPoint in Google Classroom as well. Um, however, you can feel free to pause the video as needed to take the notes. It'll be exactly the same. Now, as noted, you do need to make sure you actually listen to and watch the whole video. Feel free to turn the captions on if you're having trouble understanding me. Um, but I do say a lot of information that's not in the notes <laughs> um, comes from thy mouth. So please make sure that you're taking those notes actively. Um, I'll also have some activities for you to pause and answer along the way. So um, without further ado, um, this is George Orwell's Animal Farm and the Russian Revolution. And this is one of the first things we do near the entry level or kind of starter pack of Animal Farm. Now, I love to start with this quote. This quote is by George Orwell in 1947. And he says this, one day, I saw a little boy, perhaps 10 years old, driving a huge cart horse along a narrow path, whipping it whenever it tried to scream. It struck me that if only such animals became aware of their strength, we should have no power over them, and that men exploit animals in much the same way as the rich exploit the proletariat. Now, let's break this down. So there's a little boy, maybe 10 years old, who's driving a huge cart horse along a narrow path. This is a picture of a cart horse. So basically, if you've ever been on one of the carriage tours at Christmas, maybe at Easton or in downtown Joe Coffee, both of those are uh, examples of cart horses and carriages. So the little boy is whipping the horse whenever it tries to turn off the path that he wants it to go on. And I'm assuming, you know, it's on a good path <laughs> and going where he's supposed to be going. But if the horse tries to defy him, you know, he whips it. But it struck George Orwell that if only such animals became aware of their strength, we wouldn't have any power over them. Or in other words, that horse is obviously much stronger than a 10-year-old boy. If it wanted to, it could turn back and truly demolish or run over the little boy. Um, and that's very, very possible. Animals are much stronger than us, but we as humans and human beings have created this power over animals. And so he's saying that if animals became aware of their own strength that they had, we human beings would have no power of them whatsoever. And that men exploit or take advantage of or control animals in much the same way that the rich people exploit or take over or control the proletariat or the poor. Now there's another great example of this and I'm gonna show you on my screen. And this is uh, from Balaam and Balak. Um, so there is a story of Balaam in the Bible. And it does relate to this story. So we have Balaam and Balak, and this is in the book of Numbers 22, the NIV version. But basically, there is a donkey and there is a man. And so as this man, Balak, son of Zippor, is having a conversation with King Moab, King Moab really wants him to come and bless him. But time and time again, God says to uh says to Balak, he says, hey, like, I don't really want you going here. Um, and so long story short, Balak kind of converses back and forth with God. God eventually says, okay, whatever, just go. And so when they get there, the, the donkey, Balaam, um, keeps turning right and left. And so Balak is smacking this donkey, he's hitting this donkey, he's like, why aren't you listening to me? All without knowing that the donkey could actually see an angel um, that would have killed his, you know, kill him, would have killed the rider of the horse or the donkey. And so um, that story also would be one that I would definitely read over in Numbers 22, just because it does a really good job of illustrating this principle that if an animal would recognize its strength and its power, we would really have no power over them. So what I want you to do is go ahead and pause the video and I want you to just think about that quote. Think about how it might relate to the story. Think about how it might relate to the scripture that I just shared. Try to think about other examples in your life of how animals would be so much stronger than us if they were just aware of their power. 
So I'm assuming that you have paused the video and answered that first question with the quote. Um, if not, please pause and go ahead and do that. But what I want to begin with is the discussion on what is Marxism. So if you've taken a history class, you probably know what this is. If you haven't, it's okay. Um, but I have the dictionary definition here. And Marxism is a system of socialism of which the dominant feature is public ownership of the means of production, distribution, and exchange. I would strongly encourage you to remember Marxism is the production, distribution, and exchange. In other words, it means that ownership and wealth is distributed equally among the people. Now, when I used to teach a creative writing class, there's a really neat story called Harris and Bergeron, and it illustrates a very similar principle where basically everyone in this world is considered equal. And so I'm sure that some of you know friends who are smarter than you. Maybe you study for hours to get an A, um, but they don't have to study at all. <laughs> or, you know, your best friend is athletic and can do 100 push-ups. doesn't matter how hard you try, you can't do that. Some people are equally and unequally gifted in different skills and talents. But this is saying that Marxism is if ownership and wealth would be distributed equally among the people. So in the story Harrison Bergeron, it's a fictional, you know, made up book that was created into a film. It is really what shows what it would be like to live in a land where everybody is truly equal. So if you were smarter than other people, you would be, you would be given a hat or some type of helmet that would basically make you less intelligent. If you were stronger or more beautiful, they would do things to you. Maybe they made you walk around with weights so you wouldn't be as strong. Or if you were beautiful, they would make you wear a mask so that you weren't as beautiful. Very strange illustration, again, Harrison Bergeron, but it does illustrate this principle of Marxism well. What would it be like if ownership and wealth would be distributed equally among the people? So that would mean everybody would have equal ownership, you know, of land, of property, of things that they needed, and equal wealth. So Animal Farm is a fable that critiques the Russian Revolution in 1917, and we're going to be watching a short video of the Russian Revolution to give you an overview. We're also going to talk about it. We'll talk about on the next few slides and lessons what a fable is. Uh, fables are usually stories that involve animals that can talk and they teach us lessons. And it's also going to be a critique of the Russian Revolution, uh, aka a review of what happened during that period of time. Now a critique, this could be when I critique your work and give you a grade. A critique is when uh, you maybe you're a competition dancer, you receive a critique from a judge, Critique can also be if you go see a movie and you have a critique that you write and you put on the Rotten Tomatoes website. All of those are considered critiques. So here's a short video of the Russian Revolution. Again, you'll want to continue taking notes. The Russian Revolution.
Okay, so as a reminder, um, that video is just the overview of the Russian Revolution in 1917. So I want you to keep in context, again, that the book Animal Farm we're going to be reading, the short novel by George Orwell, is a fable that means to use animals that's going to critique the events of the Russian Revolution. So I want you to go ahead and pause the video and go ahead and write a reflection about that. How do you think that George Orwell is going to use animals to critique the events that happened in the Russian Revolution? So hopefully you have paused the video and answered the last question that I posed to you. If you have not, please pause the video and do that first. But here we go. This is a short little review of Animal Farm for you. Things are about to get a little bit strange on Manor Farm. Farmer Jones has just locked up the hen house and stumbled off to bed, thinking all is well in his barn room. He probably wouldn't believe the events that are about to unfold in the barn. Old Major, Mr. Jones's prize-winning boy, has just gathered the animals together for the meeting. Pigs, hens, horses, dogs, ducks, and goats congregate to listen to Old Major share his dream. Humans are the enemy, Old Major tells his fellow farm animals. They produce nothing, yet they own everything. Animals, however, work their whole lives for their masters. They receive only enough food to keep them working. Old Major believes that someday this will all change. Animals will work together to overthrow their oppressors. Animals will create their own farm where they will live and work in harmony, plenty, and equality. The days of slavery will end, the rebellion will come, and every animal must be involved. They must be equal. Will Manor Farm become the first true animal farm? George Orwell wrote this book, her novel Animal Farm, between November of 1943 and February of 1944. He wrote a preface to the novel that was never published. In the preface, he basically explained his purpose for writing this novel. One, he was angry that the people in Europe admired Soviet Russia. And two, he wanted to write a critical novel about Joseph Stalin. So even though this book, as we read it, guys, is going to be really odd conversations between animals saying how much they hate human beings, really it is that underlying, underlying meaning for George Orwell's anger towards the people in Europe that basically had an admiration for Soviet Russia, and he wanted to write something that would critique how he felt about Joseph Stalin. As we read, we are gonna talk a lot about fables. We're also gonna talk a lot about which historical figures each of those characters will represent. For example, Old Major. So George Orwell decided to write Animal Farm in the form of a fairy tale or a fairy story. A fairy tale is usually written for children about magical or fantastic events that are not true. Um, fairy tales, I think, you know, if you're a little girl growing up, you usually think about Cinderella, Rapunzel, Ariel, all the Disney princesses are fairy tales. Now, Orwell originally submitted Animal Farm a fairy story in order to stress that it was fantastic, but unfortunately it was not untrue. <laughs> um, again, because he was representing Russia and the different characters of the Russian Revolution, um, they could not publish it as a, as a fairy story. So the literary form of the animal fable has been used for centuries. Here's a good picture of Aesop's fables. I was read this one as little, but basically Aesop's fables are stories that use animals to teach us lessons. I remember reading the fox and the grapes when I was little, the lion and the lamb, um, you know, all sorts of different stories. So animal fables are short stories that teach a moral lesson. They include animals that often talk and they do act like humans because Again, they are using animals to teach us a lesson. Animal fables soon developed into more complex forms of literature, and this is where we get the word allegories. Again, an allegory is a story that includes characters, setting, etc., but they have literal and figurative meanings. That means they are exactly what they say literally, but they also include figurative interpretations that they want you to take away from the story. For example, you know, there's like the tortoise and the hare, or different things like that, where someone said he wins the race, um, learning to be patient, all of them teach us 
very important. Space. So literal and figurative meaning plays a massive role in Animal Farm. Now, George Orwell's Animal Farm is a allegory. Um, like I've said so far, it can be considered fables, it critiques the Russian Revolution, it's also considered an allegory. Therefore, the novel has both literal and figurative meanings. So on the surface, Animal Farm tells the story of farm animals who are tired of obeying the orders of a cool master, and that's the story's literal meaning. It is, you know, farm animals are tired of the treatment from human beings, they feel like slaves, and they're tired of it. Um, for example, a pig is still a pig, um, the horse is still a horse. But it's important to understand that Animal Farm also has figurative meaning, and so this novel also tells the story of Soviet Russia during the Russian Revolution. For example, a pig is still a pig, but it's also a political leader that's going to represent the different characters that we're going to talk about in the next following slides. And again, you guys really need to make sure you get these terms down, like um, allegory, fable, fairy tale, fairy story, and you especially need to understand these characters that I'm going to go through. Um, I'm going to go through both the animal, um, but I'm also going to go through the historical figures that are representative of the animals in the story. Satire is another uh, term that you should know. It is written as a satire, and satire is where we get that critique. So satire is a form of literature that criticizes the subject by making it seem ridiculous, amusing, or con contemplatable. Um, the purpose of satire is to make a moral judgment, to correct some wrongs, to criticize injustices. Animal Farm makes the Soviet Union seem laughable and despicable. Again, this is in bold. You want to make sure you know that. Animal Farm and the Russian Revolution, a comparison. In order to understand George Orwell's literary masterpiece, Animal Farm, you need to know a few people and events that played important roles in the Russian Revolution. First, uh, you may have picked up on this in the video, is Tsar Nicholas II. Tsar Nicholas II was Russia's last Tsar um, or leader. He was part of the uh, Romanov dynasty that ruled Russia for over 300 years. <laughs> This word means emperor, and it comes from the word Caesar, which is what I actually started to say um, instead of Caesar, is Caesar. The Russian Caesars lived in a magnificent palace called the Kremlin, and Nicholas was narrow-minded and incompetent. He was an autocrat, which means a self-appointed ruler who holds all the political power. Can you imagine being in charge of everything? That sounds horrible to me. In March of 1917, there were food riots and army mutinies in Petrograd, a Russian city. Nicholas couldn't cope, and so he abdicated the throne. In Animal Farm, you should know that Mr. Jones represents Cesar Nicholas II. Uh, if you write anything down, I would write down a little summary of Nicholas II, as well as that he represents Mr. Jones, yeah. which is the pretty much only human being in the story. Now we get to Karl Marx. Now I learned a ton about Karl Marx in college. Um, really fascinating. He had a lot to do with psychology at the time. Um, but obviously this is hint, hint, wink, wink, where we probably get Marxism. Um, so in Animal Farm, Old Major is going to represent Karl Marx. This is going to be that pig that's going to say, hey guys, let's start a revolution or start something against all the human beings. Marx believed that the workers, the proletarians, primarily the poor people, were the true producers of wealth, but the capitalists uh, owned the means of production, land, and industry. Therefore, the capitalists made huge profits while the workers earned just enough to survive. Definitely not fair. That would be like me working as a teacher, you know, 50 plus hours a week, but somebody else is making all the money. Marx called for workers of the world to unite against their capitalist oppressors. Marx believed that eventually the proletariat would become so numerous and so impoverished that they would rise up against the capitalist system throughout the world. Now, hopefully you're already kind of picking up on this, but if we get to the previous slide, if Cesar Nicholas II is Mr. Jones, the human being, the farmer, and now we have Karl Marx, who's going to be old major, the pig, and he is who, again, is getting all the characters together and saying, hey, we need to revolt, kind of aligns with, he called for workers of the world to unite and uh, go against the capitalist oppressors. Again, he believed that 
these people, the workers, would become so numerous and impoverished they could rise up against a capitalist system. Leon Tchaikovsky is going to represent Snowball. Snowball's a really fun character. I won't say too much about him, but I would write that down. And Trotsky was a brilliant intellectual speaker who organized the Red Army and led it to victory against the White Armies in the Civil War of 1918-1919. Leon and Stalin basically disagreed on Russia's future, so they're going to butt heads. So again, um, he's going to disagree with our other characters, Stalin, that we haven't gotten to yet. But he, uh, Trotsky, wanted the communist revolution to be worldwide. Stalin wanted to protect the Soviet Union from the outside forces, or in other words, keep communism in the USSR. Stalin defeated Trotsky at the Communist Party Congress in 1927, and he gained control of the secret police. Trotsky was chased away by the KGB, the secret police, and he fled to Mexico City, where a Soviet agent killed him with an axe in 1940. Uh, you'll probably pick up on that in the story when we talk about what happens to Snowball as the story progresses. Finally, we get to Joseph Stalin. He is going to represent Napoleon. While most Russian leaders belong to the middle class, Joseph was born into the peasant class. That means very, very poor. Unlike Trotsky, Stalin was not well educated. He could not discuss Marcus theory on a sophisticated level. He was named general secretary of the Communist Party in 1922. He was in charge of really dull paperwork for the Communist Party. And though this position seemed unimportant, he actually used his position as a secretary to gain supporters for his future rise to power. He eventually did defeat Trotsky in the struggle for power, which you saw here again. Trotsky and Stalin did not get along, but Stalin, kind of the underdog, was able to defeat him. So you want to think about that. Um, Napoleon was able to override Snowball, even though Trotsky was the very intelligent speaker. Stalin had a lower class upbringing, a peasant tree, and he used that unimportant job as a secretary to really gain power. This is probably something where we think about people who are rich really can't relate to other people super well, um, and, and not in a dogma or dogmatic way if you are someone that's very wealthy, but just in the sense of people who have more humble beginnings can sometimes better relate to people. And that's really what Stalin did, was he was able to use, hey, like, I'm a secretary, I can relate to you, oh, I'm helping you. And that eventually did gain him interest and power. Under Joseph's rule, however, the country fell under totalitarianism. And this is something that you will see a lot in the book, The Hunger Games, totalitarianism. But it is a form of government with strong central rule that tries to control individual freedoms. You'll also see this in the story I mentioned earlier, Paris and Bergeron. Basically, Stalin instituted something called the Five Years Plan to increase economic growth, but he ordered farms to give most of their produce to the government. Peasants often slaughtered their animals and burned down their farm buildings rather than give them to the Soviets because they're like, nope, if, you know, I can't keep it for me, then sucks to be you, I'm not giving it to the government. Peasants who opposed Stalin were sent to labor camps, deported, or executed. Sounds very similar to a Holocaust. The five-year plan created a man-made famine. Five million people starved to death or were executed as a result. And before I go on, make sure to uh, make sure to that you write down what the five-year plan is and that you write down totalitarianism. If you need help remembering totalitarianism, think about the word total. Um, basically, it tries to, to control the total control of individual freedoms. Now we get to the Moscow Purge Trials, and by 1936, Stalin began to use what would become known as the Moscow Purge Trials. This is what he used to control other people, because as you know, with the Holocaust and Hitler in the book Night, that you can't do that by yourself, but there are methods to control other people. So in 1936, 16 prominent and loyal communists publicly confessed to unbelieving crimes, spying terrorism, plotting with Leon Trotsky. There was no evidence on their guilt other than the confession, but all 16 were executed. About 70% of the party leadership became victims of the Great Purge. These trials served as an example of what would happen to people if they opposed Stalin. Again, think about how this relates to the Holocaust. So go ahead and pause this video, and I want you to answer this question. How does the Moscow Purge trials, or how did the Moscow Purge trials 
in conjunction with Stalin's behaviors, his totalitarianism, that ruling process, his upbringing, how does all of that relate to the Holocaust? How does that relate to the book Night that we've read, the Great Depression, all of those things? Although exact figures cannot be determined, some historians have estimated that Joseph Stalin may have killed as many as 20 million people. To put that into perspective, consider the fact that Hitler is believed to have killed 11 million people in the Holocaust. That is just a crazy number to think about. I know for myself, I didn't really grow up hearing a lot about the Russian Revolution, besides my history class, of which I didn't love history class. Um, but I mean, I did hear about the Holocaust and I knew about that and I knew how awful and atrocious that event was. And yet to think that this killed almost doubled the amount of people in the Holocaust and yet it's rarely talked about is just insane. And so with that, this is kind of the end of our introduction PowerPoint. Um, again, you'll want to make sure that you go back, take any of those notes as needed. Um, but if you guys need anything, just let me know. I'll see you in class. Make sure you pause the video appropriately. Take your notes. Um, most likely there will be a quiz. Have a great day.